I'm Mara Holtzgove. I teach at California College of the Arts, and I teach uh, the history of industrial design and a, num a number of other classes, contacts. And I'm more the I'm the, I'm less the scientific person and more the culture, context, history, meaning person. Um, so I want to. Uh, tell you, I mean, I was an art history major in college, and I got really interested in design because I found that design is a public art of our time, and um, I hope that I can convince you of the same thing. Uh, taking all of the ideas that you've just taken from the scientific point of view that Ron introduced you to, and I'm going to help you see how aluminum uh, is embodied. Um, and the question is utility versus beauty. You know, we've seen all these practical uh, uses of, of aluminum. But in front of me here, I have some beautiful things, um, and I want to share them with you. But what I first want to do is say um, that uh, a lot of what the Exploratorium does is the same way that I teach in my classes. Now, how many of you, maybe you're more like a sciencey crowd, so you didn't take art history, but is there anybody who took an art history class? Okay, what is the thing that you did in art history? Memorized. Memorized. Didn't anybody sleep in the back row? You know, the lights go down, the slides go up, and the, you know, uh, some of my students, well, not my students, but students who have been in their art history classes, I said, well, what do you remember from art history? And they said, I remember having a really good nap about three times a week. So um, I'm hoping that with these objects, which is the way I teach, the way I bring uh, the history of industrial design to life in my classes, it's really pretty much the way Exploratorium does. Um, they bring science to life uh, because you're doing and you're thinking. And uh, maybe you may have heard uh, this famous line from Confucius, which was, um, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. And I think you can see how everything outside of this room here is something about doing so that you have a deeper experience um, with what you're learning, and you have something to take away from that uh, tangible experience with science. Well, I bring tangible experiences to my industrial design students, and hopefully they have more memorable experiences that way. So uh, this is a way for things to come alive, and this is why you see these objects in front of me, and that's why Ron uh, tells his story of science through the objects, because it becomes more memorable that way. So. Um, we're going to get to my slides before I talk about these objects. And those of you, try to stay awake. Uh, it won't be long. But I want to tell you why I'm here tonight. Um, I'm here tonight not just because I'm an art historian or a design historian, but I'm here because the day after Stephanie wrote to me and said, you know, we need to come have someone talk about industrial design and aluminum. I went to uh, a graphic design critique, and the graphic designers from um, Rod Cavazos' class were designing fonts. And they were designing different, you know, letter forms. And you can see, I'm, I have three examples here uh, on the on the screen, and you can see how each one is very, very different. And one of the ways that designers test their work is they actually put it in a, real, a, a position of reality. And so um, each one of these uh, graphic designers was told, you know, you need to write these, you know, take your fonts and you put them in letter forms. And right there in front of me, burning inside of my mind was the word aluminum, aluminum, aluminum. All of these like beautiful different ways of thinking about aluminum. And I went home that night and I said, okay, you got to say yes to Stephanie. You need to be here on the stage because aluminum is not only a, you know, in, in this version, you know, it's, it's a useful tool to test a graphic design font, um, but it's also a really beautiful word. I mean, there's no denying that aluminum, at least the word itself, is both useful and beautiful. <clears throat> so um, Ron talked about uh, all the kinds of different things that uh, lumen ha aluminum um, can do. And so I've listed here, I don't know if I'm not going to read them. You can see them on the slide. But aluminum has so many great properties that designers have loved using aluminum. And not the very, I mean, the most important probably is its light, lightweight and its ability, ability to be malleable. Um, so it can do all of these things. The last one I want you to look at, recyclable. 
And actually, if I would be uh, more correct here, I probably could have made a no whole other line of these qualities and properties of aluminum that was recyclable, 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 recyclable. Because aluminum can be recycled so much. It's once we get it out of the ground, which Ron was mentioning, it's really, really tough to get it out of the ground and get it you know, in a position where we can actually work with it. But once we do, we can recycle it almost infinitely. This is a really, really important aspect of aluminum because it allows us to create sustainable products that then once they've, uh, they've lived their lifespan as the products that they are, um, then they can go on and be something else. So that's really important. Um, but also, you know, what can we do with it? We can do almost whatever we want with it. Um, you know, it, it gets strength, strong when we heat it. Uh, it casts into any form. We can drill it easily. We can make very precision objects with it, you know, or materials that then can go to create other things. Um, all of these things uh, make aluminum a material or a, 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 a what do I want to say, a substance that we really want to use in industrial design. So. Um, Ron mentioned uh, the idea of using aluminum for flight, for getting off the ground, because it is so lightweight, uh, it was almost absolutely necessary. Now, the first Wright Brothers plane did not have aluminum, but their production model actually had aluminum. So the struts you see and parts of the engine were made out of aluminum because they knew in order to get off the ground and, uh, most importantly, stay off the ground once you're up, uh, not crash, they knew that they had to have an air, they had to create fly that were very, very um, uh, able to stay up in the air. Um, another fun use of aluminum is the, actually the birth of this American leisure entertainment travel industry. And Wally Byam, uh, who was in California, in Southern California, making Airstream trailers, uh, discovered that you could take these sheets of aluminum and you could bend them around. Now, this is a very early example. Um, this is not from 90, 1936. It's a little bit later. But I did want you to have a specific date when he started making um, the Airstream trailers out of aluminum. They were known as the silver bullets before, I think, is it Coors that's the silver bullet now? Uh, Coors in these called silver bullets. This is the first silver bullet, um, at least uh, product-based silver bullet that doesn't kill. Uh, anyway, so the, this... Um, thing that Wally Byam was so, who was so passionate about traveling and wanted to enable people to travel, it exploded um, following World War II uh, when Americans, when the American middle class was growing and they had leisure time and they had a little bit of extra money and they really wanted to see the world. Plus our you know, car culture was growing, the interstates were growing and, uh, or the interstates would come later and then they made uh, travel and leisure travel, uh, actually a passion for many, many people. And, and Wally Byam actually started us in our mobile lifestyle. Um, I want to talk to you also about uh, living. Uh, this is uh, an example in the Henry Ford Museum of uh, R. Buckminster Fuller's Dymaxion house made out of aluminum. And he, he envisioned it in the 20s, very, very early on. I mean, he was so visionary. People just didn't know what to do with his ideas. Um, there's a famous term that uh, was uh, stated by Raymond Lowy, who is a, a one of the classic you know, fathers of industrial design in the United States. And he created the Maya principle, M-A-Y-A, -A, standing for most advanced yet acceptable. Now, the reason I'm bringing that up is he, they were, he was a contemporary of our Buckminster, Buckminster Fuller, um, but the problem is, is that um, Fuller's ideas were way, 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 way too advanced. So far advanced, nobody knew what to do with this kind of a house design, this circular design that turned out to be extremely uh, sustainable. Um, he actually envisioned the whole system for living in this space that would be um, that you would, instead of taking showers with lots of water, you would have a mist shower. And you would dry your clothes in some way that was very low water related. Um, and it was about uh, energy efficiency. And they were cooling because you had this fan on the top that would pull the hot air out. Anyway, super efficient. But the problem is that that Buckminster Fuller's ideas were instead of Maya, I like to say they were Tana. They were too advanced, not acceptable, which is one reason why when you go home tonight, you don't go to your Dymaxion house and take your missed shower before you go to bed. Too, too far advanced. Um, but many of Buckminster Fuller's ideas were 
uh, able to be made. Um, and so he is the father of the dome, the geodesic dome, which in some uh, structures had to be built out of steel. But this one, um, built in 1959, very early on, was made of aluminum tubes. And this is for the, um, the uh, ASM is the American Society of Metals. I think that's perfectly appropriate that this geodesic dome that unites this, um, the materials park of this organization is actually made of aluminum, a very pure, pure metal. Um, here's a quote, here's what they said. They said, it makes the dome a highly, oh, every part of the dome works together synergistically to give it strength, which makes the dome a highly appropriate symbol for the members of this association, each providing knowledge to strengthen the whole. So symbolic, um, as well as beautiful, as well as functional, as well as sustainable. Um, and I'm not sure why we're not living in dome homes yet either, but that may happen. We may see that happen. Um, now, thinking of utility, in World War II, we were building bombers, we were building submarines, we were building all kinds of armaments, and uh, we needed places to sit. So this was um, actually, uh, the Emico was designed this chair, uh, a 77 step process that you can go online and watch the 77 steps, handmade with, aided by machines. Um, this chair, this Navy chair, so indestructible that it's actually funny because um, Emico, they have a sense of humor like the Exploratorium does. Um, they take it through a bunch of tests. So they took it through the three floor drop test. They basically put a target on the ground, throw it out the window, it didn't break. Right, just a little scuffed on some of the edges. Um, they did a catapult test where they like put it on a catapult, pull it back against a wall target. Uh, it survived the catapult test too. Um, they also, uh, because they were interested in showing that that anodized finish is really, really solid, they put it through the hamburger test, which was to take bits of uh, um, ketchup and mustard and a burger that they heated in a microwave and then they rubbed it all over the chair and let it sit and it, st it stood the test. So um, it actually lives up to its guarantee, uh, lifetime guarantee that Amico um, has for this chair. I have a couple more images, the pop top, we know about it. Here is the patent for it, very serious design. Um, I'm going to read to you the patent and easy open can end having a retained tear strip extending diametrically partly across the can end defined by a score line and a graspable pull tab adjacent on the outside and the end open blah, 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 blah. Okay, you have a patent because your writing is obscure enough to not have somebody try to steal it. Uh, in any case, this is the um, actual quite dem demonstrative uh, drawings for this patent. They didn't just patent the actual tab itself, but they patent, patented the motion, the interaction of when you open that tab. So the next time you have your Coors Light Silver Bullet or Diet Coke or whatever it is, you know, think about the ingenious innovation that went behind getting that pull tab to work. Now in the whole opposite direction, three other uh, pages of drawings uh, by a friend of mine, Larry Lasky, who is a, uh, an industrial designer and who in the late 80s worked with many of the Italian designers uh, who were really envisioning a kind of wacky, goofy, uh, forward thinking design. It wasn't necessarily about being functional. It was about asking questions and letting your objects ask questions. And I actually brought this piece here and I'm gonna hold it up right now. Where's my candle? I'll show you how it actually looks. It's called drip. And the idea was that once you light this candle, it would drip down, down, down. But the problem is, is that aluminum uh, is cold until you make it hot and it would catch right here. I asked Larry if that bothered him. He said, no, no, no. It's a piece about a concept. It doesn't have to work. And his sketches, yeah. And some, that might explain a lot of uh, contemporary design these days. It doesn't have to work. It's about an idea. So in any case, I think you can start to see the correlation between these drawings which show how the designer is thinking. They don't show the final product necessarily, although there are some sketches that get to the final product, but they really reveal what's going on inside of that creative mind. And the, the, the uh, pencil sketch is an important tool for industrial designers because you can't really make this until you think it out on paper. 
And now I'm going to show you probably the most provocative, sexy uh, object that is made out of aluminum. Um, I like to call this design porn. Um, it's uh, made by Mark Newson, one of the most uh, globally known designers, even before uh, this sold for over a million dollars at Philips Dupuri in, uh, in London. So in 2009, an example of this, he made only 10 of them. And it's funny because when he first made them, they were such a pain to produce. He had to mold this fiberglass body and then take these different pieces, sheets of aluminum and perfectly match them and rivet them, hammer, ham hammer, hammer, hammer into the, this body um, in order to create these curves because aluminum wants to be straight. I mean, you look at this object here, it wants to be straight. But in fact, it, he, he was able to mold this to fit this shape. It's like a, it's like fluid mercury. It's curvaceous. And it's what my husband Stephen Holt called a blobject. Um, he, Stephen and I, uh, Stephen coined the term in the early uh, 90s to describe some of this curvaceous and fluid design that he was seeing. And uh, I think it's an example of, you know, when you don't know, uh, exact, there's not a word to describe what you see, you can make up a word. It's a kind of uh, linguistic creativity. So blobby plus object perfectly describes uh, this Lockheed Lounge. And just so you know, uh, when Mark Newson was talking about what a pain it was to make these, uh, he was selling them for $1,000. That was about what they were going for. And he said, I'm only making 10. It's too much of a pain to make. And I think because he limited that addition to non-production, uh, that's why they ended up being that expensive. Let me just give you a little lowdown. I said, uh, in 2009, this sold for $1.6 million in London. The next year, another version of it, $2 million. And just last year, another version sold for 3.7 million. So, I mean, it's tricky because if Mark Newson had made 20, they probably wouldn't be, be as valuable. But uh, I think it is interesting, you know, when we start talking about art, uh, design as art, this is really when design entered into this fine art field. Um, and I'm just going to stop there. We can think about this. And I want to talk to you about some of the objects on my table here. And I'm going to start with utility. So we have a funnel. Seems maybe kind of a boring thing. You're familiar with it. But imagine the technology involved in having to spin this and create this funnel in such a way that it would function and it could be manufactured in the gajillions, probably. And I have a lunch box from, box from my stepmother's uncle, who he took it to work every day. And what did he have in it? Let's see. He had, uh, here's a drinking cup. Lovely little piece there. You know the collapsible drinking cups. Now they're made in plastic, but this is an early version made in aluminum. I love it. What does he have in here? Let's see. Oh, we got a chicken noodle soup. Um, pull tabs, so it's this, this era. He was definitely not taking chicken noodles. Uh, let's see, uh, spam. Spam in an aluminum can, and it also has a pull tab. I'm not making a bracelet out of these pull tabs because I'm not buying that much spam. This is purely for... Uh, illustration. Uh, let's see, he's got um, a printable spun uh, beer can and a monster drink. Oh, he definitely did not drink monster drinks. But uh, those two, now they've realized this pull tab is a place to get your branding across. And I can't make a bracelet out of a monster drink because they filled one of the holes with that M, that uh, graphically designed M that defines it. So, practical things. We also have uh, a paint palette, and what your, uh, what your film used to come in before we actually had film that came in plastic containers. Now, I mean, what's film? Do, uh, some of you know what film is, right? Film canisters, all right. So we'll just put that there and that there. And then I want to talk about this, one of my favorite, favorite objects. This, um, Ron was mentioning earlier, hot and cold. Uh, in the thermos, where is it? Right there. This is a Miro hot and cold server. So when you're making your post-World War II, 1950s modern buffet on your indoor, outdoor sunset house, you put this on the buffet table and you either put your baked beans in it or maybe you put your ice for your martinis. I'm not sure. But 
it's a great example of how you can take that anodizing that Ron was talking about earlier and you can actually make it an aesthetic part. Um, this, I love this because uh, to me it's a great example of post-World War II space age modernism. You know, it looks like a bomb, uh, but it's a benevolent bomb that holds beans, although maybe it's a bomb later. Let's, I won't go into that. Um, Another set of objects that, talk, that we can look at to understand what um, anodizing is about is these gorgeous, very cylindrical uh, drinking cups that were made uh, and anodized in these colors. These come in a whole range of colors. I only brought three today. But they're almost an example of machine art, you know, where, where the precision of machine manufacturing allows us to create an object that is so, like, perfect in its form, yet also beautiful. Um, and machine art is a great way to be thinking about a lot of products that are made out of aluminum, because aluminum has such a great, um, you know, a great exterior uh, look to it. Now, I've already talked about Larry Lasky's um, candle here, can or drip candle holder. I want to bring up another object, and this is the final one that I'll talk about. Um, what the heck is this thing? Orange juice squeeze, or lemon, if you happen to have a lemon. Um, so uh, this was created around the same time, and I actually want to put these as dueling objects here, because they really show together the possibilities of aluminum. You can take a slab piece of aluminum and accept, you know, as a designer, aluminum looks great in slabs, and its finish has this great sort of brushed uh, matte uh, finish to it. And I'm going to allow and accept that this is in slabs. And if you look at the back, you can actually see where those joints come in. You know, so this object, even though it would be not necessarily seen this way, it would be, you know, up against a wall, it still is in such a way that, that we can appreciate how it was made. And I love that. And actually, Larry, the designer of this, really loved that idea that the traces of how it's made are right there. And he is actually telling me um, about a conversation he had one day with Philippe Stark, who is a famous French designer, the designer of this strange object, which we have established as a, an orange juicer or a lemon juicer. Um, they're totally different. This one was molded and, uh, or cast, sorry. And it's really meant to be a very provocative object, although we're going to test it and see if it functions. Because look, we happen to have a little cup here that fits nicely under there. Most cups don't, by the way. Um, that's the biggest complaint for people, is that most cups, very nice sharp knife. It must not be aluminum. Um, anyway, we're going to test. What do you think? Is it going to work? It works well. Uh-huh. We have someone. Uh, let me tell you something about this object before I actually use it in front of you. Um, this is an object made, or it's a product made by Alessi, which is an Italian um, housewares manufacturer, mostly you know, stainless steel and plastics and things for the table, arts of the table. Um, but actually, this object is, a, is something that they sell more than anything uh, to newlyweds as a wedding gift. So I don't know, if they think that they're going to make lemonade or they're going to like, life gives you lemons as a, a newlywed couple and make lemonade, or whether it's used as some sort of a weapon and I don't know who gets to pick this, maybe it's in the prenuptial agreement, I don't know, you know, who gets the Alessi juice squeezer, but let's just see how it works or if it works. Now, if I was being really critical, if this was one of my students, I'd say, where's the handle? But I'm not going to say that to Philippe Stark. He's way more famous than me. Um, <laughs> lovely. So uh, now we've gotten to see a number of different kinds of aluminum. And I would like to know who would like a souvenir bracelet uh, to take home. And I actually have a way to figure out who's going to take. I only have, wait, I have one, two, three, four. I'm going to be, I'm going to sacrifice for my art here. Uh, I have five. And what I have here, are pull tabs, uh, many red, uh, mostly silver. So if you are interested, come forward, and I'll hold this up, take 
uh, take one. And if you get a silver, I'm sorry, you have to walk away without a souvenir. But if you get a red, um, these are actually Budweiser pull tabs. And I was laughing before, the, before uh, I went on that this is probably the only way Budweiser could get into the Exploratorium because it's San Francisco. We have way too high taste. Sorry, Budweiser. But in any case, you, Budweiser's here today. Um, so if you get a red, you may choose from one of these colors. So who would like to... Um, come up. And I w before, we, before we do this, I want to remind everybody that we have seen utility in aluminum. We have seen beauty in aluminum. And I want to put forth a new word, butility. I think most objects made of aluminum can be both, butility. Thank you for coming no, no to Everything Matters, Tales from the Periodic Table.